Speaker, and ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag Good afternoon and welcome to the joint Minnehaha County City of Sioux Falls joint meeting on September 6, 2016. We'll start with uh, a attendance on the um, county commission side and I will note that there is a quorum present. City side. Roll call for city council please. Council members Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Kylie. Here. Neitzert. Here. Rolfing. Selberg. Here. Starr. Present. Staley. Uh, quorum is noticed, noted. Item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda on the county side, please. One moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. On the city side, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Second, second or from back. I have a motion and a second on the city side to approve the agenda. Roll call vote. Council members Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Okay, with that we'll move on to item number two, which is joint public hearing of the Siouxland Libraries. Good afternoon, Jody. Good afternoon. Um, as you can see, this I'm not Mary. This I'm Jody Fick, Assistant Director of Siouxland Libraries. Two weeks ago when we had, would have originally met, Mary would have been here giving the presentation, but she has since retired. So today you have me. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having us. We are pleased to share our 2017 budget request with you, highlighting the activities that will be supported by this budget. We want to thank finance and especially Brooke Parsons for her part in putting this budget together. Um, a quick history of Siouxland Libraries. Siouxland Libraries was created in 1995 with the merger of Minnehaha County Rural Public Library and the City of Sioux Falls Public Library. We have five locations in the city and eight locations in the county plus a bookmobile. Library overview. Our library strives to deliver current and relevant materials, provide fast and efficient service, promote reading, learning, and discovery, and expand access to library services. And this budget will allow us to do this. Our service focus is based on the premise that libraries assist people's desire and need to learn for life. We are with you from cradle to career and beyond. Prior funding for technology implementations continues to support our efficiency efforts and the expansion of access. Our strategy is to provide staff the greatest opportunity to assist customers with direct service and to apply technology in support of their efforts. Our underlying responsibility is to provide current and relevant materials and that continues to be the basis for all of our services. It is imperative that we continue to provide broad access to information and resources, whether print or digital or in the form of the programs and presentations that our staff put together. Um, in 2015, we checked out an average of 10.3 items per citizen. Nationally, it's, it's closer to the eight figures, so we're proud of the use of the library that our citizens do. We spent $3.75 on per citizen on our materials in 2015. This is well below the national average. And when you look at those, lo those locations that are in our area, Lincoln and Sioux City and Rapid City and Fargo, we are not the bottom, but we are in the bottom third for what we're doing. So I th I'm proud of the work that our staff does in getting materials efficiently and cost effectively. The library promotes reading, learning, and discovery. We are, we are about using 
We are about both independent education and partnering with other agencies to ensure that our community has access to learning for life. Any number of our programming efforts will involve the community partners, the schools, the businesses, and the organizations. Our reading, learning, and discovery concept applies to all ages. We, um, in 2015, the picture that you're seeing in the presentation is showing um, a program that was put together based on a Latino American grant that the library received. And we had various activities. This one, we had a group demonstrate some of the dances that their heritage used. At the library, we have divided our staff into programming teams and selected people and given them some very specific training so that they can focus on the different age groups. We have a group for our early learning, and they've done some training with family place libraries. And so now we've brought that back into the library, and we're now doing workshops with the community where um, parents and their children can come in and learn how to just interact with their children in our in reading, singing, talking, playing, all those things that the, our earliest people need to develop. Then we have an after school group, which is aimed at your school age children, both after school and then throughout the entire summer. We're trying, um, we're partnering a lot with the schools to find out what are the extra things that they're needing their kids to learn, and then we're developing programs based on that. Um, we're doing special programs for teens and tweens, 20 somethings, adults, and seniors. I was going to talk a little bit about our teen programs. This past year, we had 335 teen programs. Um, a significant component of our teen programs are our teen advisory boards. Uh, many of our branches now have teen advisory boards where the, the kids are coming and meeting on a regular basis and giving us feedback as to what are they needing in a library, what are the specific information needs that they have. And then they are now helping develop programs which teaches them to do the jobs that we're all doing, and they are now becoming the mentors for our, our younger children. Um, one of our groups, we've partnered with Washington High School, and the group's called LibCats, and that one's a very successful partnership with the Washington High School Library, and they've had some fun overnight lock-ins at the school because of the library. Children. The children is the heart and soul of the library. Everyone knows about preschool story time. Well, effective reading, learning, and discovery really starts with a partnership with parents. You know, the parents are the children's first teacher and most important teacher. And so we've been trying to figure out things to do that help support the, the parent. Our LAPSIT programs help teach parents how to interact with their child, how to read to their child, the importance of that language development. We now have a 1,000 books before kindergarten where we have developed a program to try to get every parent to read at least 1,000 books to their child before kindergarten because it's demonstrated that that helps in that learning readiness, that language acquisition that is so important. Now the budget, the numbers. For 2017, the budget request is for an operating budget of 7.3 million, a capital budget of 0.9 million, for a total investment of 8.2 million. The operating budget for the library, most of our money is in personnel. It is our people and their knowledge and their expertise and their connection with the public that makes our programs possible. Um, our staffing will have a slight increase to 5.7 million. Our other operating is 1.6 million. It had a significant uptick this year because we are right in the middle of our Kaylee remodeling project. We will be open by Christmas, correct? Yeah, <laughs> hopefully sooner. The operating budget major changes um, for 2016, our budget started with 8.3 million. Wages and benefits are going up by 200,000. 
most all of that is due to contracts and regular cost you know cost of living increases and stip increases we are not expanding our staff we just keep looking for ways to use them more efficiently and effectively um, professional services are going up 9,000 that is for our databases which are very successful and being used more every day um, rentals is going up 57,000 that is our computer equipment and our fleet charges and parking charges repair and maintenance is going to be down that 1.1 million 1,000 1.1 million because of the Kaylee remodeling project supplies and materials is down 58,000 in this year we had some one-time grant money that went into supplies and materials and we won't be needing that next year because it was for specific equipment that we won't need to do next year um, training and travel down 11,000 um, for the in the library world there is one major conference that we send staff to and it's an off year for that and utilities down 3,004 are 7.3 million in the capital budget, the majority of the money goes to our books and AV materials. Of that 892,000, 745,000 of that is for books and materials. The rest of it is we're doing network upgrades at multiple locations, putting fiber optics into Prairie West and Oakview. Those weren't done at the time of construction. At the time of construction, it probably would have been ideal, but our technology needs keep increasing. We also, this next year, have E-rate grant opportunity, which should give us a reimbursement of between 60 and 80%, depending on how many children in our district are in the free and reduced lunch program. So, and then we're also going to be upgrading the internet connections out to our Crooks branch. And in addition, at Crooks, put up to date the HVAC system. In the, in the budget request, the portion that comes from the Minnehaha County is 1085000 This is an increase of 3.75% over the 2016 allocation. Um, the funding from the county is a specific tax levy. So the, the citizens back in 1960 voted that they wanted to have library service because there was no county library service at that time, and they voted to tax themselves. So those funds are gathered each year, and they can only be used for library services. Each year when we prepare our budget, we receive information from Bob Litz and the auditor's office and based our request and what we can do in the county based on that. In this past year we've actually been able to expand some of our library hours because of increased efficiencies with our technology hmm. value of library service um, the event center is impressive 645,000 well at your libraries you had 1,222,000 visitors last year a lot of people coming in the doors um, the P and we also have our visitors who don't come in the doors. We have 24-7 access to our electronic resources, and we have people downloading books and movies and audios and audiobooks in a, in a steep curve upward. Um, we had 2,140,000 items checked out last year. If you valued those at $20, which is a conservative price, that would be $42,000,000. 802,000 so the value of our library card priceless do you have any questions are there any questions for Jody on the budget for the library thank you Jody um, I'm taking it we take a motion to approve at this point I would look for a motion on the county side to approve the budget for Siouxland libraries I'd make a motion to approve the library budget on the county side. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously on the city side. Move to approve, Urban uh, Mark. A motion and a second on the city side. Uh, roll call vote. Council Members Erickson? Yes. 
Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three on the agenda is joint public or joint budget hearing for Metro Communications. Good evening, I'm Anna Raker and I am the business manager for Metro Communications. And you may be aware that we are in the interim period without a director, but we're very excited to welcome Paul Niedringhaus. Um, today is his last day with the county and um, he will begin in our agency on Tuesday, September 13th. So we're very excited to welcome him. He was in the office today and brought a few things in and um, he's been in to meet our staff and um, we think he's gonna be a, a great leader for us, so. But um, we're excited to be here uh, in the, um, on behalf of Metro and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our budget to this joint group. So our agenda for uh, today is we're gonna review, um, give you an overview of our budget. We'll start with revenue, uh, move on to personnel expenses, operating expenses, capital expenses, cash balance. Um, we'll give you a little bit of a taste of our future and um, give you just a quick summary. Our budget um, presentation today pretty much focuses on um, dollars. Um, but if you have any other questions, um, please be sure to ask and we'll do our best to answer those. So moving on to revenues. Okay. Thanks. Um, our major source of revenue is our 911 surcharge. It uh, makes up approximately 64% of our revenues um, for our budget year. Um, when you look at the 911 surcharges, um, it's made up of actually two pots of money. There's the traditional surcharges which flow through Minnehaha County and come directly to our agency and that's about 88% of those particular revenues. The other 12% is an incentive um, and it's a pot of money that's set aside by the state and awarded to um, 11 different centers across the state who meet the qualifications to earn the incentive pot. And so about 12% of our 911 revenues comes from the incentive funds. Um, you can see the, um, the bar or the line chart there showing um, how our 911 revenue has changed. Um, Obviously, there was a significant growth in 2012 to 2013, and that's representative of the fact that there was legislative change in the surcharges, and they increased from 75 cents per line per month um, to $1.25. Now, that entire $1.25 doesn't come to the local providers, um, approximately 86 cents comes through with the traditional surcharge, and then the balance goes into a pot of funds that the state manages a portion for equipment upgrade, um, maintenance, so that local entities don't have to um, handle those charges in or those expenses within their budgets. And then the balance goes to those um, centers that meet the qualifications, which is the incentive. And so a little later when we were talking about cash flow and we're talking about our um, capital outlay, um, it's significant because that's what afforded us the opportunity to change our budget dramatically because the state um, took responsibility and took on the entire cost of the E911 phone system upgrade um, in August of 2015. And they're also handling those maintenance costs. And so that's a great um, benefit to us as an agency and it is to everybody across the state. One thing I will point out is in our budget, we did forecast the sunset provision um, effective July of 18. And so it's important to remind you that in July of 18, 
this legislation that was enacted in July of 12 will sunset. It won't roll back to the 75 cents per line, it will roll back to a dollar per line. Now, that doesn't mean we're gonna get, uh, lose 25 cents on the dollar, because remember that pot of money is kind of split up um, and forms basically three different pots. So um, we projected about uh, $200,000 loss per year if that sunset provision um, is enacted. So it is a significant loss to us. And I know that um, you had a presentation not too long ago um, with the city council regarding um, your legislative um, agendas. And there was some discussion then. The next major source of support, obviously, is our city and county support. Um, that makes up about 33% of our revenue for 2017. We were able to um, pass action on a $0 increase to the city and county. And this is in great part, really, in, in total part, to the fact that the state was able to use the funds from the 911 surcharge revenue to pay for the entire E911 phone system and then handle the maintenance moving forward. Um, as you may recall, we had been building our cash reserves in order to be able to afford this major investment of this phone system. And once we realized we didn't need to, then we can spend that cash reserve down. We try to manage our cash reserve carefully so that you don't see a major spike in city and county support in any year because we know that that's not something that's easy for you to absorb. We try to plan ahead. Uh, the balance of our support or the balance of our revenue is about 3% and that's miscellaneous fees, interest income. It's, a, it's a, obviously a very minor amount of our budget and we didn't give you a specific slide on that but I'll just uh, mention that. Oops. Personnel expenses. Um, personnel expenses are over 80% of our budget. They're actually around 83% of our budget. Um, our staff are the significant, um, um, our, our most significant resource. They're about everything we do. Um, when we budgeted for 2017, we calculated our expenses using about 98% of a fully staffed 47 FTEs. And we did that because we acknowledge that turnover is a common, um, a common occurrence in this industry. It's a very stressful job. Um, shift work is not for everybody, and so turnover is, is something that we factor into our budget. We budgeted 5.9% overtime, and we have worked really hard over the last eight years to really bring our overtime um, down, and, and we've been very successful for many years now, and it's through a concerted effort from our entire management team, our coordinators who assist in the center, and our staff. This budget reflects a 15% estimated increase um, for health insurance. We were just advised, um, I just got noticed that our dental insurance is a $0 increase, which is amazing, but we'll, we'll see what happens with health. That's always the big question. This does include an increase in FTEs, and that's based on actual st stats in the center and um, that presentation to Metro Management Council and their approval of increasing one staff person on B shift five days out of the week. So it's just one FTE. We did negotiate a two and a quarter percent um, COLA increase with our union and that also was approved by Metro Management Council. So that's included in this estimate. Moving on to operating expenses, um, we were able to budget a zero dollar increase. Part of that is due in part to um, um, no, no uh, maintenance on our phone system. And um, we also um, have been, um, I guess, very diligent in trying to be as efficient as possible with our resources and our expenses. Um, we may see some additional um, reductions in future years based on the 
um, maintenance contracts and how things will change with our public safety software and also as the E911 e system is implemented and our connectivity for the PSAP for the 911 dispatching changes. As far as capital expenses, in previous years you saw a fairly substantial amount each year for the financing of our E911 phone system and that has been removed. But what we do have in both 17 and 18 is a $100,000 um, contribution to the public safety software that is um, going to be implemented and I believe you've had additional presentations on that so I won't go into any additional details there but um, that is in this year and next year. Cash balance. Uh, you can see that our cash balance was slowly increasing um, from 2008 um, through 2014 and 15 and now you're going to see it decrease and that is by plan now that um, we don't have the responsibility of that major phone system purchase. Um, but what is significant to you as a joint group is the, the effect that the, sur the surcharge sunset will have on our cash flow. Obviously, um, you can see that we're funded through 2021. Um, if, that, if that legislation were not to sunset, um, our cash flow would result in about a four to five hundred thousand um, dollar cash reserve or cash balance at the end of 21. So it is significant. Um, but I guess that's pretty obvious when we're talking about a couple hundred thousand a year. Some things to keep in mind for the future. Um, the surcharge distribution, um, which, when I'm talking about the incentive here, is, is um, based par partially on the census. And we have been waiting for what the 2015 census results will be. I just got that information and our first check increased um, just a week or two ago and um, basically about $900 a month. So it's a small increase, but obviously the population in Sioux Falls has grown, and so our incentive has grown because of that. The other thing to keep in mind is as other agencies, if they consolidate, more people will join that incentive pot, which would then make it shared among even greater numbers. So. Um, depending upon um, how our growth compares to others, joining that group um, will affect how that incentive fund um, changes. And we've talked about the surcharge sunset um, with a cash reserve of you know around four to five hundred thousand in 2021. That would obviously allow us solvency through at least 2023 to 2025. So just to give you a kind of a quick recap of what we've talked about, our total revenue increase for 2017 is 1.6%. And the majority of that obviously is from the 911 surcharge revenue. Um, city and county support will remain at a $0 increase. Our personnel increase is around 6%. That's in great part to um, um, cost of living and step increases for existing staff, the addition of an FTE, and then just um, assumed cost increases on health insurance. We are maintaining a $0 increase on operating and our capital outlay, we've added the 105,000. And most importantly, we're going to start using our cash um, because we know that we don't have the major capital outlays we were building for in the past. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions for Anna? Any, oh, oh, one, Councilman Kiley. And it's, it's not really a question, but it's more of a comment. Anna, I'd like to congratulate you and your staff for not missing a beat in the last few months while you have been without a director. And I know that uh, Darren left a big hole and we're filling that hole. Uh, with Paul Niedering House, and I'd also like to thank uh, my colleagues on the county side for providing us with an excellent individual. I know it's going to leave a big hole for you to fill in the sheriff's department, 
but Paul is going to continue to serve both of us well in his new position with nine, uh, with the Metro 911 agency. So, but again, thank you very much. And then also regarding the surcharge, the 911 surcharge, that is something that all of us need to work our local legislators on to to make sure that that sunset does go away because otherwise you, you can see the obvious impact that it will have on our budget here. So we do have a little bit of time, but that should begin with this next session and, and hopefully move forward at that point. If not, we would still have one session remaining. But that is an important item that we should all address. And it's gonna affect everybody across the state, obviously, not just us. Thank you, I was gonna make that point as well too. There are other 911 agencies out there that will be impacted negatively too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions or comments? Thank you, Anna. With that, I would look for a motion on the county side to approve this budget. Move for approval. Second. And a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. On the city side, is there a motion? Move to approve, Erickson. S second, Staley. A motion and a second on the city side. Roll call vote, please. Council members, Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Neitzert. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Starr. Yes. Staley. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, item number four is the joint budget hearing for the Sioux Land Heritage Museums. Well, good evening. Bill Hoskins, Director of Siouxland Heritage Museums. I'd like to start off uh, and tell you a little background on the Siouxland Heritage Museums. The museums, <clears throat> the Siouxland Heritage Museums, it's dedicated to the experience of learning for our community, its families and visitors through the collection, preservation, and interpretation of history. Um, we currently operate the old courthouse museum and the Pettigrew Homan Museum. The old courthouse is owned by Minnehaha County. The Pettigrew by the city of Sioux Falls. Both are on the National Register of Historic Places. They were designed by the same architect. They're both a little over 126 years of age. Um, our visitation with the Siouxland Heritage Museums in 2015 was uh, a record year, 85,000. It was just up over 5.5% over the year before. Uh, the museums are open to the public daily. Uh, the, our busiest days of the week typically are Friday, Saturday, and Thursday in that order. The busiest months in 2015 were June, October, July, and August. Uh, visitors came from all 50 states and 29 foreign countries. The museum staff uh, manages a collection that uh, numbers over 102,000 cataloged objects. They, they range in size from the Faywick Flyer, a one-of-a-kind car built here in Sioux Falls in 1908, uh, down to things a little bit smaller than a dime. Uh, our museum staff presented over 688 programs last year to 49,000 people on and off site. Uh, we did 1,300 tours of the historic home, Pettigrew home, and uh, ended up serving 51 K-12 schools in 24 school districts, including every single school in Minnehaha County and the city of Sioux Falls, uh, and 28 daycares. Um, <clears throat> our exhibits, we have six exhibition galleries at the Old Courthouse Museum, two at the Pettigrew Homan Museum, not including the historic house. Typically, we will open four to five new exhibitions a year. Our goal is one every quarter. Uh, our cost, total cost per square foot for our exhibitions is $64.68. Uh, that includes labor. Uh, material cost is about 934. And just as a comparison, uh, the Center for Western Studies opened a new exhibit last year. 
they employed a commercial company, uh, Split Rock Design from the Twin Cities, and that exhibit cost about $250 a square foot. Uh, rentals of the museum, uh, particularly the old courthouse, uh, are a source of revenue and, and of visitors. We had 102 rentals last year for over 7,000 people. Uh, we have uh, currently, there are about 93 rentals uh, contracted for tw the rest of 2016, well, for 2016, and about 22 that have already been contracted for 2017. Uh, staff works about, well, last year, about 380 additional hours above and beyond our regular open hours. All the costs of rentals are, are, uh, are, are paid for by the Museum Enterprise Fund. So uh, although full and part-time staff work additional hours, those hours are reimbursed to the operations budget from the Museum Enterprise Fund. And, and uh, I'll, I'll try and talk more about those budgets as, as we get in, but there's a lot of interaction between those budgets. Our museum volunteers uh, are priceless. We uh, couldn't operate the museum without them. Last year we had over 100, we had 141 volunteers that donated about 4,400 hours. Um, <clears throat> They, uh, in, we increased the number of volunteers by 11% and the number of volunteer hours last year by 32%, which was significant. Our volunteers are recognized annually at a volunteer banquet that's held at the Old Courthouse Museum during volunteer week. You'll all get an invitation to come. Uh, it is sponsored by the Siouxland Heritage Museum Alliance, which is a private nonprofit friends group um, that operates in support of the museum. The volunteer program is, co is coordinated by one of my museum interpreters on a part-time basis, Jesse Nissum. One of the things that um, doesn't come up in budgets, uh, pr probably should, but I decided to include it here, is, is something we've gotten a lot of in-kind donations. And uh, it's gone up considerably in recent years. A good example is a number of years ago, we started a program called the Into the Pit Quarry Tour, which is a program we do cooperatively with concrete materials. Uh, two years ago, uh, well, in the past, we rented the bus uh, to put on the program to take into the pit. A couple of years ago, concrete materials started renting the bus directly and, um, and, and so it's, we still get to do the program, but we have no actual cost to the museum. And, and it's things like that that we're tracking um, now as well. The Siouxland Heritage Museums were formed through a joint cooperative agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County in June of 1974. It was actually the first cooperative agreement between city and county government. Uh, we have an 11-member board, five people appointed by the city of Sioux Falls, five people appointed by the county. The 11th person is the president of the Siouxland Heritage Museums Alliance. Actually, she's here tonight, Diane Metley. Uh, that's a private uh, nonprofit corporation, a friends group that supports the museum. Anyway, Article 4 of the Joint Cooperative Re Agreement requires that the museum board prepare and recommend a budget to the city and county commission. Our budget is really five budgets, but if you think it as five parts uh, instead of individual things, although each one has its own road rules, as I, I like to say, we have the museum operations budget, the maintenance budget for the old courthouse museum and the maintenance budget for the Pettigrew Museum, those are tax-based budgets. We also have two revenue-based budgets, the Museum Special Enterprise Fund and the Museum Store Fund. Uh, most of those budgets interact with each other at some point during the year. Um, if you look at them as a whole pie, the operations budget is about 75% of that. Uh, the Pettigrew budget about 3%, the old courthouse museum budget 4%, 16% uh, is the enterprise fund, and 2% the museum store. 
The museum's operations budget is one of the joint budgets. The city supplies 50%, the county 50% of that operational budget. The budget's administered by the county, and that's why all the museum staff are county employees. Um, the budget year is a calendar year, and uh, in 2017, our budget request is 1,064,953, or 532,476 from each the city and the county. Of that, 93% is human resources. Uh, the remaining 72,000 is operational expenses, and we're asking for $199 more in that area in 2017 than in 2016. Uh, the biggest part is personnel. Uh, we have 16 full-time employees. That includes the custodians. Um, we are asking for no new positions in 2017. We're no increase in the number of part-time hours, although we're asking for a part-time uh, hourly rate increase of 25 cents. Uh, this does have two full-time positions, the museum events coordinator and the um, exhibits assistant, who are paid for uh, two-thirds by the operations budget and, and one-third of their salary is supplied by the museum enterprise fund. So uh, their check comes out of the operations budget and then at the end of each pay period, the money is taken from the enterprise fund and transferred back into the operations budget to cover that expense. Uh, we also have in this budget uh, two paid internship positions for summer labor, and uh, it also includes changes to the county pay matrix as dictated by the county commission and an estimated 6% increase in group health. And, and our major goal is to continue to really expand our volunteer program, uh, and they're doing a great deal to help us. We have two maintenance budgets, one for the Old Courthouse Museum. The Old Courthouse is owned by Minnehaha County. Uh, they supply all the money for that operation uh, maintenance budget, and it's administered by the county. Uh, it may look as though uh, this budget's going down. It isn't. Um, the commission moved some money around and uh, some of the maintenance money for repairs at the old courthouse museum have been shifted to the building fund, which is a little bit different puddle of money. Um, our major projects, I I'll talk about it, a lot of it has to do with just ongoing stuff, keeping the steam traps going and uh, re minor repairs. We also have the Pettigrew Homan Museum. That's owned by the city of Sioux Falls. The city provides the budget. Uh, it is administered by Minnehaha County. Uh, any monies that are not spent at the end of the year are, are um, settled up with the city at the end of the year. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> we're, we're asking for a budget in uh, the Pettigrew maintenance of 41400 for both buildings, one of our major projects over recent years has been uh, electrical use and consumption. And we've really been working on our lighting systems in years. Uh, basically, we've converted all our gallery lighting to LEDs. We've significantly decreased our kilowatt, uh, our electrical costs, by about 20%, actually, in both buildings. That's continuing on as we actually have to uh, start replacing some of our fixtures that are just obsolete. So as uh, our, our light track and um, um, spotlight cans are, are so old, you can't replace them when they break. We have to essentially replace the system. And so we'll be starting a systematic work with that. Uh, both at the Pettigrew, which we have actually started this year and will continue, and at the courthouse probably starting a little bit next year. Windows are what make our buildings the spectacular structures that they are, and they also can be the bane of my existence. 
Uh, we have 280 window openings at the old courthouse museum, 61 stained glass windows, a large skylight that occasionally leaks. Uh, at the Pettigrew, we have 95 window openings and have, over a number of years, been working on reglazing all the storm windows. And, and actually, as of right now, we have 93 of those done out of 95 uh, and have rebuilt openings a number of window sills. Uh, we are embarking this year and will be continuing next year. Um, the, the Pettigrew is actually three constructions. You have an 1889 Queen Anne home. You have an addition added by Frank Pettigrew in 1923, and then a addition added by the Public Works Administration in the 1930s. Well, the, um, uh, the federal program was, did not contain um, highly skilled stonemasons, and instead of window uh, lintels of stone, they use steel. And what we're facing now is the steel lintels is corroding and expanding on some of the windows and causing uh, distress to the window openings. Anyway, that's one of our major projects that's ongoing. Of course, the Pettigrew is on the National Register. All repairs have to comply with the Secretary of Interior standards. Uh, for historic preservation. So that's uh, a little bit about what's going on with the maintenance budgets. The Museum Special Enterprise Fund is a revenue fund created in 1996 to receive revenues and account for expenses associated with the provision, rental of space in the museum system from sponsorships and in the provision of programs, events, and services for which a fee is charged. I deliver an annual report to joint meeting of the city council and county commission, and it's usually in March or April, depending on the schedule. And at that time, you're going to get a detailed report of how we've at, the money we've actually spent. Um, we're asking for a budget in 2017 of 224,487. That is actually uh, spending authority in that budget because I need to generate revenue to be able to spend it. And the revenue comes from a variety of different places. We're projecting educational programs will bring in about 13% of the revenue to support that budget. We have a museum endowment that's sponsored by the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation. Revenue from that endowment should supply about 20% of that projected revenue needed. Uh, we're the recipient of another uh, endowment, a uh, small amount from Doc and Florence Brown. Um, the Alliance, uh, the Siouxland Heritage Museum Alliance, will provide us with some cash, about 8%. The museum store, we're hoping to, through a balanced transfer, have the store help support educational programming uh, in the enterprise fund. Grants, uh, I projected that at about 8%. Rentals will bring in about 32% of the income and, and cost within the enterprise fund in 2017. Fees for services, we do at times do uh, exhibit work for other organizations, the state of South Dakota. Um, currently, we're doing some work for um, Stockyards, Inc. Uh, and finally, the donation box. Though that's what I projected our revenue to be. Uh, and in the future, I'm hoping that we'll see some increases in revenue through uh, increases in space rental fees. Uh, we did increase space rental in 2015. We have not yet f seen the full impact of that because of how far out people are contracting for space. Um, but we do evaluate that on a biannual basis. The same with a lot of our programs and fees for services. Uh, also, the board has uh, set a goal of doubling the uh, endowment in the next five years. And so uh, that's something we're working towards because that endowment revenue would certainly help support the enterprise fund budget. Um, where's that money going to be spent on, the revenue that comes in? Well, it uh, projected will pay about 33% of those two full-time positions. 
it pays for about 100, well, 100% 100 of those internships that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it pays for 100% of the cost for providing the rental space, uh, including the labor. About 84% of our collection supplies and materials and 100% of all artifact conservation. Uh, 60, two thirds of the cost of our exhibit supplies for providing exhibitions. 100% of the education programming and supplies. Uh, all staff travel and training. And uh, if we have the income, we may try for a new van for the education staff going out. But again, we'll be generating the income before we can spend it. Uh, in terms of numbers, uh, a breakdown really comes, we're spending about 22,000 on education, 31,000 on the, our exhibitions program, 33,000 on collections management, rentals about $20,000 cost, uh, marketing 16,000, and uh, other really encompass all the labor, uh, the van, and I do always include a small amount for uh, specialized building projects that come, may come along and uh, just need to be taken care of. Finally, I have the Museum Store Fund, which is a revenue fund established in 1990 to account for expenses and revenues associated with operating the store. We were projecting a store budget next year of 21568 and the state auditors wanted me to pull out the balance transfer uh, a, as a separate number, but noted uh, um, it was included in previous year's budgets, but uh, we have in the past transferred six to 7,000. 10,000 is a little bit uh, higher number, but uh, I think we can support it at this time. In total, we're asking for a budget uh, of $1,407,528. The budgets that are needed to be adopted this evening are the museum operations budget, the enterprise fund budget, and the store budget. Those are the ones that are considered joint budgets. Uh, I know there's a great deal that I've thrown out there. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Other questions for Bill on the museum budget? Seeing none, I think we can take one motion for all museum budgets, correct? I don't have to do all three. So is there a motion on the county side to approve the museum budgets? I'll make that motion. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve the museum budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. On the city side, is there a motion? Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Selberg. I have a motion and a second on the city side. Roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Bill. Thank for you coming. very much. Item number five on the agenda is discussion of future joint meeting schedules. Um, Robert, did you have some information on this or did you just want me to go with this? Good evening, Robert Wilson, Assistant Commission Administrative Officer for Minnehaha County. And uh, following the uh, scheduled meeting that uh, we were not able to hold a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jim David and I just had a couple of conversations of uh, give, wanting to, at, at the very least, give you an opportunity to uh, take a look at, the, at the, the monthly schedule of this meeting, see if there is a time that works better for you, and, uh, and if there is a way that we can, um, can, can do better, to, to, we would certainly like to do that for you. So we really are just throwing this open as your opportunity to see if there is a, a different day that you would like to, to schedule this meeting, understanding on the city side that your, uh, your Tuesday evenings are, uh, are pretty full, so your, your options may be limited, but we just wanted to give you the opportunity to look at other options if that might work for you. My very vague understanding of this is that, as you've noticed, most of the time we only have three commissioners available and we do have a conflict, I think, on most Tuesdays on the particular Tuesday we've always had our meeting on and is there a possibility of moving it to another Tuesday? Is that correct, Robert? Or a total different time? Um, 
In, in my initial conversations with, uh, with Mr. David, the, this time at other Tuesdays through the month is fairly limited on, on the city side. So we, um, I, I don't know that we were bringing any particular uh, suggestions forward for your consideration at this point. Uh, just if, if you, uh, as, as the joint body, had, had ideas that you wanted to, to toss out and, and you would like us to work, work through as staff to try to, try to accommodate a, a meeting time that, that works better for your schedule, we certainly would do that. Are there any comments? Uh, Councilman Staley. Have, have you ever had the city council come into the county commission and like meet after your meetings on a Tuesday morning? In my seven years with the county, I, I think there have been a couple of times where the, uh, the uh, council has come into the uh, commission chambers. I think in a lot of ways, uh, it's a, it's a space, uh, it's a space uh, issue Problem. there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of any time that we have met following our meeting at a, a Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock. Robert. Um, it's been brought to my attention this might not have been posted as an agenda item on the city side so we will not be continuing this conversation at this point so um, with that I would look for is there any old business is there any new business I would look for a motion to adjourn on the county side all those in favor or a motion please make a motion to adjourn second I have a motion a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed same sign motion passed unanimously the city side is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. Voice. 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 This is fine. With a voice. All those in favor say aye. Those aye. on the aye. same aye. side. Motion passes unanimously. We